everyone. It is such a pleasure and such an honor to be here. My name is Lindsay Peel, and I am the founder and principal consultant at Kingdom Vision Consulting. We have such, such, such amazing content for you today. First, I want to just thank you for being here. Thank you for investing in yourself. You are a part of an amazing movement, Blaze. Listen, we are building leaders and accepting zero excuses. Zero, okay? This is our time. I know we hear often that the future is female. No, our time is actually right now. My goal for this workshop is to teach you guys how to become a woman of class in finance, in your business, overall in your family finances. Listen, we have some great stuff for you. I hope that you guys have a pencil and a piece of paper to take some great notes. Make sure that you are ready to learn. Make sure that you are open. Make sure that you are ready to receive, but also ready to release some of your fears, some of your anxiety when it comes to finances, but especially when it comes to building your business. We are going to get our slides prepared for you. Give me one second. Ladies, it gives me so much joy, so much pleasure to speak with you all regarding the topic of finance, but specifically being a woman of class within your business. Personal finances, business finances, entrepreneurship in general are very near and dear to my heart. I know that this is the first time that some of you all are meeting me, so I love to share some of my story. I am a second generation entrepreneur. My mother and father started a business after the age of 40 once I was born. And listen, 20 plus years later, here I am. I am a living testimony. My parents did not have any fancy degrees. They did not have any entrepreneurial experience. But what they did have was, was hope. They had desire. They had a dream. And they also had a purpose. At that time, having a child at the age of 42, when they did not have any sustainability in their finances and their work and professional lives, they had to find a purpose. And I was that purpose. I am so blessed to have my parents. I am so blessed to have grown up within the entrepreneurial space. My father is a plumber and my mom has been running the business for 20 plus years. And they have ultimately created a life for me, but it's also a life of service. I truly believe in giving it back, paying it forward, because had it not been for my parents and everyone who invested in them, I would not be here. I am also a Howard University alum. I received my degree from Howard in broadcast journalism, had no idea that I would not be on somebody's news station by now. However, God had a different assignment for me. I started in the banking industry while I was a student at Howard. I matriculated through my banking career, pretty much covering every role within a retail banking space from a part-time teller, personal banker, business banker, and ended my banking career as a branch manager and business development officer for a few locations in Baltimore, Maryland. So listen, I am passionate. I am excited, but I also have the experience that you all need to feel comfortable, to feel confident in receiving what it is that I have to share. So listen, who, are, who is Kingdom Vision? Who are we, right? Kingdom Vision Consulting, we are a financial services firm that specializes in personal and small business financial capacity building. We ultimately support entrepreneurs of color in their efforts to create financial security for their families. We assist our clients with formulating and employing financial strategies that allow them to maintain a positive cash flow, build business credit, save strategically for future pro projects, and increase their personal net worth simultaneously. Yes, we do it all. Yes, we help you do it all because you cannot be a successful business owner without having a solid personal finance foundation, but also you don't want to be a business owner and your personal finances are rocky, but you also cannot scale and grow your business when your business finances are a little rocky. We're about setting the foundation personally and in your business so that you can grow, so that you can ultimately create a legacy within your business. 
Our mission is to educate, empower, and employ financial strategies that create generational wealth specifically for entrepreneurs of color. Our vision is to break the poverty cycle and shrink the racial wealth gap for communities of color. Listen, when you look like us, we already know that we come at a disadvantage. So it's up to me and other professionals in this industry to make sure that you have the resources, that you have the social capital, but also helping you find access to real capital to create an enterprise, to grow your enterprise, and to remain confident in your journey. A lot of people want to know what makes us different, right? What makes Kingdom Vision Consulting different is that all of our clients partnered with our one-on-one -on -one consultations, whether it's a group coaching program or our educational seminars, they are all led by industry experts who not only have the education, but also the necessary experience experience to educate our clients. It's hard sometimes to trust what somebody has to say if they have not been there before, right? That's something that we don't always necessarily say, but we think it when we listen to a lot of webinars and we join this summit, right? I want to encourage you and also just ease that moment for you to let you know that you are in good hands. We operate <clears throat> off of five key principles transparency, respect, understanding, support, and transformative change, okay? Listen, if you can see that spells out trust, because ultimately people do business with who they know, like, and trust, but also because finances can be a very interesting topic. It can be a hard and gruesome topic to, to overcome sometimes. We want you to know that you can trust us, and that's how we lead in everything that we do with every client, with every financial partnership. Our process is simple, literally. It's simple. We lead with education. You have to learn. You don't know what you don't know until you find out what you did not know. We lead with education. We encourage our clients to implement what they're actually learning. You can't just hear things. You can't just take notes and not do anything about it. It's about the execution piece. After you're able to implement those strategies and you see that they actually work, you duplicate it. Listen, managing your money does not have to be difficult. You just have to start. You just have to do it. You have to learn. You have to figure out what it is that you don't know, what you need to gain access to. You need to start implementing those strategies and become a master at execution. And you do it all over again. You duplicate the process. And ultimately what that does is that it helps you to create the legacy that a lot of us dream of, but but honestly, some of us don't even dream that big because we don't know that we can have it. I am here to remind you that you can have it all in your personal finances and in your business finances. Today's workshop is called Woman of Class. What does class mean? Class stands for the five key financial pillars that we support all of our clients with at Kingdom Vision Consulting. C, Credit worthiness, long-term wealth, asset protection, strategic banking partnerships, and strategic asset accumulation. Now, I know that sounds like a lot, but truly, it's the overall basis of what your personal finances and your business finances, honestly, are built on. And we want to encourage you, give you some advice, but also give you some tangible things that you can walk away with and start implementing today to show up as that woman of class in your business, in your family, but also in your community. Listen, let's talk about credit work again. Let's talk about why it's important as an entrepreneur, specifically when you are a business owner. And depending on your lender, usually if you own more than 25% of an entity, you are considered a personal guarantor. Yep, that means that they're going to review your personal credit nine times out of 10 when you are looking to apply for any type of capital with a traditional lender 
or with an untraditional lender. Although untraditional lenders have a different viewpoint on credit, they still will review it to help create the story for who you are and who you show up as in your business. Now, listen, I know all of us were not as fortunate to have parents who added us as authorized signers before we were 18, or a lot of us weren't even fortunate to have financial literacy conversations, right? Just conversations at our dinner table. That is okay. It's about what you know now. What are you able to learn now that can set you up for financial success? I know it's like sometimes beating a dead drum. You want to talk about credit, credit worthiness here in your personal life, credit worthiness here in your business finances. I know that it can become draining and overwhelming when we're trying to figure out, well, how do I increase my credit? What am I doing wrong? How many credit accounts do I need to have, right? What should my balances be? What are they look? What does the bank want? What are they looking for from me? What is that secret number? There are so many questions around credit, but the most important thing is that when somebody reviews your credit profile, they are making a decision to lend to you based off of who you have shown up as in the past. Now, listen, because I can be frank with you guys, because we look like each other, okay, some of us are cleaning up messes in our credit that we didn't even do. Some of us, had to experience someone putting something on our credit when we were two and five, a, a cable bill, a cell phone bill, whatever that bill is, and now you feel stuck. Now you feel like you are being treated a certain type of way for something that you didn't do. While that happened to you, and it's unfortunate, we got to clean it up. We have to stop sweeping things under the rug. Now, listen, if I can get real personal, I know that sometimes when you don't necessarily want to pay it and you just want it to go away, you run through all of your options, right? Well, can I ask this person for the money, right? A lot of times, that's not even an option for some of us. Well, can I get it removed completely, right? Sometimes that can absolutely work. Will you have to submit documentation? Yes. I've also had some clients who didn't want to do that because the credit bureaus wanted them to submit a police report. Who wants to submit a police report on a family member who did something to us when we were young, right? A lot of times we don't want to do that, but I'm here to encourage you that you can overcome your credit barriers. Your past does not define you. Even if you did have an issue with your credit that Honestly, you probably did. It's okay. It's also about what you know now that can help clean up the things that you did not know prior. A lot of times we're looking for that secret number. What is that hot number that I need for my institution to fund me, right? And a lot of times it really can depend. You can have a 700 and might get declined, right? But you can have a 680 and might get approved. It all just depends on your overall credit profile. How old is your credit history? What type of accounts do you have? Do you have that di of diversification within your credit profile? Do we have revolving accounts? Do we have installments? loans? Do we have, you know, do we have any type of mortgage or auto loan? Depending on what you have, everybody's situation is very, very different. I encourage you today, listen, go and check, pull your credit report. You want to know where you stand when it comes to your credit. That's something that you want to know off the top of your head in any conversation. When you walk into your financial institution, even if it's to make a deposit, you don't know who you might meet that want to have a conversation with you to point you in a direction of a new product or service. A lot of times, though, they want to know certain information about you that you need to know about yourself. Self. I encourage you to go to annualcreditreport.com and pull your free credit report. It's free. It's free. It's free. And you can get a report from all three credit bureaus for your personal credit, right? Even when it comes to your business credit, business credit has reporting. The numbers look very different now. You won't necessarily see an 800 in your business credit. It typically goes up to 100 but you want to start building that business credit as well. You want to start 
someplace. A lot of times we we bootstrap our way by using and exhausting all of our cash out of the bank. We exhaust all of our old retirement accounts, and then we want to go apply for credit. I learned the golden rule in banking. You always want to apply for credit when you don't necessarily need it, because typically that's when you can get that favorable approval, because why? Typically, you have not exhausted all of your your funds yet, right? Typically, you have not maxed out credit cards at that point yet if you technically didn't need it. You want to be prepared. You want to stay ready so that you do not have to get ready. That can come in the form of business credit cards, right? I always say shoot for rewards if they have them. Business credit cards, business revolving lines of credit, right? Those lines of credit makes it so much easier for us to scale because we can pull out that cash right there and it's as simple as a transfer or some institutions have a card that's attached to that. Some institutions have checks that are attached to that. It makes it it makes it a little bit easier for you to access that capital, but you have to learn what you need to even gain the information for those resources. To become a woman of class, we have to be credit worthy. We have to be personally credit worthy, but we also have to be credit worthy in our business. I encourage you to connect with a financial partner, whether it's a personal banker at your financial institution or a certified credit consultant or someone who has the experience, but also who is reputable and has been vetted that can truly, truly help you get to where you want to be. And honestly, sometimes you can do it yourself. YouTube University is an amazing thing, right? We can gain access to so much information literally at the click of our fingertips, right? We just got to do it. We have to understand that it is important. It is one of the key steps to being financially sustainable. Not only does credit give you access, but it gives you a special access. It gives you discounted rates, okay? I like discounted rates. Because la even last year, right, when I purchased my car that's now on Turo, we're going to talk about other business ventures, um, I was able to get a 1.9% interest rate. That's amazing. And I did that through deal of financing. And that was even, that was lower than what my credit union was trying to give me. But you have to be credit worthy. Being credit worthy gives you access to the capital that you need, but it also makes that capital that you receive less expensive for you. Listen, now when it comes to entrepreneurship, a lot of times we don't talk about this often. We don't talk about it often enough, I should say. Long-term wealth. What does that look like for some of us who are in business? When you're in business for yourself, a lot of times, not a lot of times, when you're first starting off in business for yourself, you don't have the, the cushion of having an employer contributing to your 401k anymore, right? That means you are now in charge of your future. You are now in charge of what your wealth looks like long term. It's not impossible. You just have to be very intentional about the process. Is it a goal for you? Is it a priority for you to have money so that you can retire, right? We all know that we have to count for inflation. Listen, prices are going up every day, every year. Listen, we all just experienced, we are still experiencing a global pandemic and the effects of that. But honestly, we're going to really see the effects years after it comes. So you want to start preparing yourself now. What type of retirement plans do you even have currently from your old jobs? Do you have anything that you can roll over and consolidate into an account that you can actually be intentional about managing or bring on a, a certified financial planner or a financial advisor that can assist you in that process? But we have to plan. We have to make it a priority. Way too often, we meet business owners who've been in business for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and don't have much to show for it. They can't retire. They're 70 years old, and they have to go get a, a job as a greeter at Walmart. It's nothing wrong with it, but that's not the future that you want. It is not the future that, honestly, you deserve. When you are putting in time 
energy and sweat equity into building a business, you want it to do something for you. You ultimately want it to do something for your family. We have to prioritize our long-term wealth, whether it's in a retirement a plan, whether it's in just your, your standard brokerage account where you're investing in the stock market, or long-term wealth can also include additional, additional business ventures that you may or may not be super active in. It could be just an investment for you, right? Are you considering being an angel investor? Listen, the opportunities are endless. We just have to have the money to do it. We have to have the education. We have to have the resources to know that it is possible. But you also have to know that you deserve and that you can. I encourage you, have a conversation with a certified financial planner to discuss your future. What do you want your future to look like? What do you want retirement to look like? Also, how do you want to set up your heirs for that? If you don't have a financial advisor, I say, listen, start with where you're comfortable. If you have a financial institution that has a, uh, a financial advisor in their office or some type of partner that you can be introduced to, be bold and go in and have that conversation. Schedule that appointment, right? Even if you don't necessarily feel comfortable with your financial institution, you have a number of reputable companies out there who want to help you. And oftentimes, your initial consultation is free. It just takes the courage for you to take that next step in your financial future, okay? Becoming a woman of class, it definitely takes grit. It takes a willingness. It takes resilience, but it takes a will. And it has to be a priority for you. We got to make sure that we're credit worthy, but we also got to make sure that we are planning for long-term wealth. There are a lot of future millionaires that are looking at me that are exchanging this right now. If you are a future millionaire, I need you to drop in the chat, future millionaire, okay? Future millionaires plan for their long-term wealth way before they get there. They used to tell us all the time to, to dress for the job that you want and not the job that you have. But you also have to plan for the financial future that you want, not for the present time that you're living. Ladies, as we are building and working towards our goals to one, take care of ourselves, take care of our families, but also to take care of the generations that come behind us, we have to truly embody this next step of protecting your assets. Now, listen, where I come from, it's a, I come from a very small town in North Carolina. It's called Windsor. We have a population of maybe less than 4,000 people. So there were zero talks of protecting your assets because the majority of the community felt like they didn't have anything to protect. But as I start to really learn about creating generational wealth and what that looks like, you have to set up the processes even before you start to truly accumulate all of the assets that you dream of. A part of accumulating and protecting your assets is making sure that you have proper insurances, right? Listen, most of us, when you talk about insurance, we're thinking, do I have enough money in a policy to bury someone if they pass away? But that's not it. It's so much more to protecting your assets to proper insurance than just making sure that you can bury someone. A lot of times we're not even thinking about the additional uh, income that we're losing when we lose someone in our families. We're not thinking about the potential expenses that's going to come that their estate is going to have to take care of. But not only that, guys, there are so many families out there who have really, truly started to create generational wealth through proper insurance policies. Now, we're not going to really dig into all the different types, whole life, you know, term policies, universal index funds. We're not going to really dig into that, but you need to have an insur insurance assessment. I always encourage clients to make sure that you're reviewing your policies to make sure that they are relevant. If you don't do it every year, at least review your policies every other year, but at at least have one, at least have one in place. Of course, as you get older, they can get much more expensive as things start to happen with our bodies and they don't operate like they used to.
to ailments may come about, that makes it even harder for, the, for us to get insurances. Start now. Start as soon as you start learning about it. If you're just learning about insurance today and how you can use insurance to protect your assets, to protect and prepare a future for your family, then you need to schedule a consultation today, really like yesterday, but definitely today. Don't end this year without having an insurance review. Even if you are 50 and you are just learning about it today, there are still policies out there that can cover you, but you have to do it. You have to prioritize it. I'm not even 30 yet, and I have a few insurance policies because I want to make sure that my family is taken care of. They're already going to grieve you, right? But you don't want them to grieve you and go in debt behind some of the things that you left behind. It's not fair. And we don't we don't want to keep setting up our children, our grandchildren in that way, because then they have to start over, over and over again when it comes to truly generating wealth. But another very, very important token of protecting your assets is estate planning. There are so many families, especially Black families, who never, ever have an estate planning conversation. And once somebody passes away, the family is going crazy. They're fighting over assets. They're trying to figure out who gets what, why this person should get it, who they thought was the favorite grandchild, the favorite niece or nephew. But guys, if we do the work in advance to prepare our estates, to put in documentation on legal documents what you want to happen with your assets, you set your family up for such, such, such a smooth transition. Listen, I was one of the first people in my family to even introduce the conversation to my parents about estate planning and the different tools outside of a will. Now we have a family trust fund. Your trust fund doesn't have to have millions of dollars, right? They are a, it's a tool. It's a tool to have in place where you can start to transition your assets. So it's much easier to transition to your heirs. A lot of times we don't have these conversations because we don't feel confident. We don't necessarily want to admit that we don't know. And then a lot of times we feel like we just don't have enough. But these are also tools that are living, some of them are living and breathing documents that can be altered as you accumulate more assets in your life, but we have to do it. We have to learn. I would advise you to contact an estate planning attorney or talk to a life insurance agent. A lot of times they have estate planning partners that they work with. You can also work with a certified financial planner. They have a lot of the tools and resources that you need to really show you, but also create a plan for how you want to protect your assets. Another company that I love, love, love is Legal Shield. Legal Shield provides legal services services to families and business owners at an affordable rate you can pretty much have an attorney on retainer for less than fifteen hundred dollars a year a year a year yes you can get a complimentary will with that you can get complimentary consultations with almost anything that's happening in your life just at the touch of a button on your phone through their app we just have to do it. We have to know about it. So now that you're learning about it, now that you are being introduced, I am charging you to take that next step to becoming a woman of class and protecting your assets. Another really, really, really important notion of becoming a woman of class that it's not really talked about often, to be honest, is the importance of strategic banking relationships. Your financial institution should be your number one partner. Your institution should know you. They should understand what it is that you do. They should understand how you do it, why you do it, and the tools and resources that you may need to help grow in your business, regardless of what area of your business life cycle that you are in. A part of that, though, is choosing the right institution 
institution for you. A lot of times we settle on an institution that our parents had, our grandparents had for 20, 30 plus years. That's where my account was open when I was two. I don't necessarily like them. I barely even go in there, but I just had them just because we have to get rid of that mindset, guys. We have to choose an institution that is going to work with us, that is going to work for us because ultimately they use our money to work for them anyway, right? Let's let's just be real. So you want to make sure that you are maximizing on the benefits that you are getting from your institution. You want to have a banker that is assigned to you, a relationship manager, some institutions may call it. If you are a business owner and you have a business banking account at an institution, you should not not have a business banker. You are doing yourself a disservice. That relationship manager should make sure that they are checking in on you at least two or three times a year just to see how things are evolving in your business, but also how are they evolving in your personal life? What new tools and products and resources can you use, can be really helpful for you as you're growing your business, as you're truly creating that legacy that you dream of, that you imagine for, but also also, you want to understand how your bank works so that you know that you're at the right institution. Each financial institution are very similar. They Most of them carry some of the same products, but sometimes their goals are different. You might have a bank that focuses more on small business. You might have a bank that focuses on more of investments. You might have a bank that focuses on the holistic personal financial picture. You want to make sure that your financial institution is the one for you. You also want to be able to understand their structures, right? A lot of times your average small business owner does not even know that most institutions, their bank, their business banking division is split by the your, your business structure. Are you a small business? Are you a commercial business? Are you a corporate enterprise? Your relationship manager and your relationship status with the institution fluctuates based on the revenues of your business based on your, your lending with that, with that particular institution. But we have to create these relationships with a representative so that we can start to learn these things. Ultimately, you want your, your banker to be a sponsor for you. You want them to be an advocate for you. Real life story. I had a client when I was in banking. This was probably about two years ago, and she had been denied from all of her personal institutions that she had worked with. She came to me, she let me know her issue. She needed some access to capital. She did not necessarily have the best credit situation, but it was something that I could work with. But because I was able to create a relationship with her, I truly got to know her. I got to understand the dynamic of her business. I got to learn her family background. I got to learn about what her spouse does, her mother and father. I I got to understand the entire picture. So I felt connected to that client, but also that made me feel comfortable advocating for her. We submitted an application for a line of credit it was denied. But because I felt so strongly about her, her vision, her goals, and what she wanted to do in her business, but I could also see the plan that she had because she also presented documents. We have to have proper documents, guys. I could also see that there was some validity behind what she was asking for. What did I do? I picked up that phone and I called my underwriter. And after a 45-minute conversation, we got an approval. That would not have happened had she not had a business banker like myself. It is so important for you to have someone on the inside who can look out for you. You also want to know what type of resources that they have outside of the bank. What type of external partnerships? One huge partnership that is valuable to the small business community is when your business banker is connected to alternative lenders. Because guess what? Everybody's not going to be able to get approved for traditional lending through your institution. It's okay. It, it, that's just how the system works. However, if your business banker has connections to CDFIs or crown funds, sources, then you, you, the person, the client that is connected to that banker, you now have access to those resources. I had a number of clients who, unfortunately, I had to decline for loan applications. 
But guess what? Because I have partners who worked for community development financial institutions, because I had partners who supported alternative lending, like through crowdfunding, Kiva, et cetera, I was able to transition those clients to those particular organizations to meet their immediate need. Just because you get a decline from the bank, that doesn't mean you no longer need the money. Yes, we still need that funding. You just got to have the right partners in your circle to help you reach your goal. It's never impossible. It's just about the strategy. Another important piece, strategic asset accumulation. Now, a lot of us, well, not a lot of us, all of us know how to accumulate liabilities at this point. We know how to go spend our money on things that doesn't appreciate in value, that doesn't necessarily add anything to our personal net worth, right? But do we truly understand what it means to strategically accumulate assets, assets that are going to work for you, assets that are going to work for your family members, right? We have to be very intentional about where we're putting our money. I always like to encourage entrepreneurs to really step into ownership. When you own, you have so much more flexibility. Now, listen, Everybody isn't cut out to be a landlord. Everybody isn't necessarily desiring to be a homeowner and to actually live in their primary residence. But you want to choose some type of asset that you can invest in that will work for you. Just like you want your money working for you in the stock market, you also want your money working for you in other assets. Even, even sometimes a car, which is mostly seen as a liability, can be an asset for you. I mentioned earlier in the video that last year I, I purchased a new car, but instead of that car being a liability, just taking my money every month from the car payments, insurance, gas, et cetera, I turned that liability into an asset. Now that asset is a part of my income, right? So I have that car on Turo and it's making me money. It's an asset at that point. It's producing income for me and my family, which is also going to help me to further and scale my business. Listen, we all need additional streams of income. I always believe in seven. What are your seven? Everybody's may look different, but you have to choose your lane. For me, another lane is real estate. I always encourage people to dig into real estate investing because that's an industry that's not going anywhere. We can't produce any more land. We can't produce any more land. Us as Black people, we have already been disenfranchised from the growing uh, real estate development economy for years and years. It's our time, y'all. There are so many opportunities for us to truly invest in assets, especially in real estate, whether you want to purchase your home, if you choose to be a, a homeowner, right? Of course, you have the opportunity to um, have your asset to appreciate and value if you purchase it the right way. Is it in the right neighborhood? Are you taking care of it properly? Are you making some additions to that property? Last year, purchased a new condo in Charlotte once I relocated from Baltimore. And in 11 months, literally 11 months, it has accumulated in 30, more than $30,000. And now that condo is on Airbnb. We got to be strategic, but we got to create a plan, but we got to figure out what's comfortable for you. Everybody's journey is different. Everybody doesn't necessarily want to deal with the hustle and bustle of, of Turo, of Airbnb. I know we see it all the time on social media and it looks glamorous. It's great. The income can be great, but yes, that still includes work. That might not be your lane and that is okay. Do not feel pressured. Do not feel pressured to step into something that you really are not passionate about just for the sake of money. But you do want to be strategic as far as what's going to work for you and your family. Even if you don't necessarily want to own a home, you can still invest in real estate without necessarily owning a property. You have plenty of websites out there, crowdfunding sites that allow you to invest in real estate projects and receive a return on that investment. 
you're technically still a real estate investor. You just don't own the, own the particular property yourself. And that is okay. It is a way for you to strategically accumulate some type of interest in assets that can make you money. I also got to stress though, if you are an entrepreneur and you are operating in a brick and mortar location, consider owning that building. Consider buying a building in your business name to operate your business. There are so many avenues out there for us to accumulate wealth, for us to truly, truly, truly become a woman of class. We just got to start learning. We have to start educating ourselves. We have to start connecting with the right resources. Just like Blaze, you all are in the right Place. I'm telling you, there is no better time than now to be a part of this movement because women, we are shifting the entire future of our nation, of the world. It's going to be us. And let me be honest, it's going to be Black women. It's Black women. So as we learn, we teach our families. We teach our communities. We teach our entire state, our country our world. The power is in your hands. It's just about connecting with the right resources, connecting the dots to the right opportunities, doing the work. That might mean you're going to sacrifice binging on your favorite TV shows for watching some YouTube videos or listening to some podcasts or reading some new books. But you're investing in yourself, which you are your biggest asset. Because as you invest in yourself, as you invest in your mind, your intellect, it's going to reflect in everything else around you. Everything else around you. I want you all to be confident that when you close your eyes, you have set yourself and your family up for success. Your children, your grandchildren, your nieces or nephews don't have to start over. They're just picking up where you left off. We just got to do the work. We just have to be willing to step outside of our comfort zone. We have to be willing to have these tough conversations because they are tough conversations to have, especially when we have to address ourselves, when we have to address our issues, when we have to acknowledge some tough things about ourselves, but it's worth it. A lot of times we're trying to figure out, well, where do I start? All of this is good information. It's great. I want to be a woman of class. I want to be credit worthy. I want to start talking about long-term wealth. I want to start protecting my assets. I, I want to really start connecting the dots between myself and my financial institution and how I show up. I want to start accumulating some assets. But where do I start? How, how, what do I do? You got to start by choosing to reclaim control of your money. And a part of that is managing your money mindset, understanding it, being willing to transform your mindset because it has to start here. But also you got to assess and make adjustments to your money management. Where's your money going? What are you doing with your money? Do you have a budget? Do you, can you account for every dollar that comes into your, your account? I hope so. But also you have to create strategic milestones. You have to be very intentional with your goals. You have to be very intentional about what it is that you want your money to do for you, what you want your money to do for your family, but also what is this life that you want to live? What is the legacy that you want to leave behind? We actually have an offer for all of you all who took the time to invest in yourselves by listening, by being here, by being ready. Drop in the chat, I'm ready. I'm ready. On January 22nd, 2022, we are introducing a brand new workshop that has not even completely been installed yet, but you guys are going to get first dibs. It is called Reclaiming Control of Your Money, where we're actually going to dig into your money mindset, money management skills and tips and tools, but we're also going to help you create some milestones going into this new year, not just for your personal finances, but also for your business finances. Drop in the chat, tap in.
If you are going to tap in, I need you to email us today at info at kingdomvisionconsult.com and say, I want in. If you want in, we want to help you get there because you can't do it alone. We always say that it takes a village to raise a child, but it also takes a village to grow a business. It takes a village to strengthen your personal financial foundation. It takes a village to really create the, the visual for this business and financial enterprise that you want to have. You don't have to do it alone. We're here to support you. You have Casey and her team at Blaze. You have myself and my team at Kingdom Vision Consulting. You have each other. Build community amongst each other so that you have some accountability. So that you don't feel like this is a walk alone. Because you can. You are worthy. And ultimately, you deserve it. January 22nd, 2022. We are reclaiming control of our money. We are shifting our money mindset. We are reassessing and making adjustments to our money management. But also, we are creating strategic money milestones. Things that we can work towards. Actionable steps smart goals that we can actually do, that we can check off to help us reach our ultimate goal of success. I want to help you to create a legacy worth living. I want to help you build and grow sustainable businesses. I want to help you to create an avenue for retirement, regardless of what you want it to look like. It's your, this plan is yours. You're just connecting the dots with the resources to help you get there. I want to help you transition assets, assets to your heirs versus liabilities. We've passed down enough trauma, enough liabilities to our heirs before, generations before us. We're putting an end to that. You have been called to break generational curses in your family. You have been called to break the poverty cycle in your family. It starts with you, but you don't have to do it alone. I appreciate you all. I love you guys so, 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 so very much. We have such great work ahead of us. I'm excited to see where you all are going in your careers, in your businesses, in your families. Please keep up with us. You can follow me personally on Instagram at LPill the Real Deal. You are also can email us at info at kingdomvisionconsult.com. Everybody who wants to be a part of our workshop in general. January. I need you guys to shoot us an email right now. I know you have your devices close by. I know you got an extra tab on your window that you can click on really quick to send that email to say, I want in. Because you want in. It's time. Follow Kingdom Vision Consulting on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook at Kingdom Vision Consult. We are here to support you. We are here to help guide you. We are here to help become your centerpiece of your finances, to make sure that we can help you stretch and connect the dots between your goals, the people who have the resources, and you. Thank you so much. Listen, <clears throat> PSA, PSA announcement. There was going to be a TED Talk uh, in 11 minutes, but that has been shifted to 1 p.m. EST because we're in a vein, America, in Africa, in Europe, in Canada. Listen, Lindsay. Yes, my love. Yes, queen. <laughs> Lindsay, let me turn my light Ooh. on so I can see you good and you can see me good. Lindsay. Yes, yes, yes. Baby, the way you just shifted households and communities just now in 45 minutes, you, 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 you did that. The way you just shifted households and communities in 45 minutes just now. I, like I said, I'm serious, y'all. I moved, I moved the uh, TED Talk back uh, because we in a vein. We're in a vein. We're in a vein. Lindsay is here. This is the first time, Lindsay, just so you know, sis, um, over the last 
three and a half days that we've had Q and A's, the Q and A being filled up before you even came on the stage. Um, so I just have a feeling there's going to be so many questions people have for you, and I want you to be able to answer them. Um, let's dive in, sis. Yes, ma'am. Oh Lord. Wait, first of all, hold on. Do you have anything you want to say, friend? I just want to say thank you. I just want to say thank you to you, of course, Casey, and your team. But I want to say thank you to all of the ladies who are here, who are present. I see the love in the chat. I am, I am full. I am full today because of you all. I am so excited to to pour into you and to truly change lives globally, right? Yep. We're global ladies. This is international. Yep. You know, we are yep. feeding families. We are changing mindsets globally. So I am just, I'm just so excited to be here. I am looking forward to supporting you all on your journey. And just to remind you that you're not in it alone. Amen. 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 Um, so much love in here for you, Lindsay. You, the way you were in our stories, like, you know, I'm gonna take my time with this. We've been conditioned not to talk about family business, yeah. right? Because what goes on in this house stays in this house. Mm -hmm. But you said somebody put them bills in your name, right? You said nobody want to talk about estate planning, but when somebody died, they're trying to guess who was the favorite, right? Right? Um, and you said that on a global stage, meeting people who've been bound in that kind of stuff for generations. So, um, yeah, the well has been primed. We're just going to talk about it. And, and I'm just saying this to say nothing is off limits, y'all. We're among family. This is safe and sacred space. Um Let's heal. All right. So first question is coming from Jazz. Jazz asks, what advice do you have for having conversations about asset protection with your parents when they haven't been open about financial conversation, but have good financial habits? So for me, I had to start doing it myself. I had to start preparing the pieces to the puzzle. I had to start learning about what does it mean to even establish a will? How do you do it? Um, when I was in the banking industry, I would ask a lot of my clients a lot of questions. I would see a lot of wealthy clients. And of course, a lot of them did not look like me. However, a lot of them are willing to share when you ask the right questions. So I started asking questions about trust funds. How did you transfer your properties when someone passed away? You know, mm -hmm. how do you eliminate that process of going through the courts? How do you eliminate collectors trying to come after you and your family assets. Mm -hmm. So I started doing it for myself. And then I started to share with my parents. And believe it or not, my mom was actually able to hop on board. It wasn't as hard as I thought it was. I just needed to do it first. Sometimes you got to plant the seed. Sometimes they even need to see you just put a little water on your own seed first, and mm -hmm. then you bring them along. And they, they will be willing. It might take some yeah. people a little bit longer than others, but you got to keep trying. But sometimes you got to show them first how serious you are by doing it for yourself. That's good. That's really good. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Great question, Jazz. Okay, the next question is coming from Anika. We all love Anika from Queen City. She asks, what steps can I take if I'm rebuilding from the ground up? I don't know where to start. So the first place to start is figuring out where you are right now. You said you're you're building from the ground up, but what does your ground level look like? Where, what is your money mindset? How are you even thinking about wealth? Also, in that reflection, take an account for where you've been. What have you done? What have you seen? Let's talk about those past experiences. And let's talk about some things that you want to unlearn. But let's also identify those things that you want to learn. Because in order to really get to where you want to go, you got to figure out where you are. But you also have to identify where you're going so that you can create the steps to get from A to Z. So identify what does your ground level look like? You know, ground level is different for everyone. But what do you consider to be building from the ground up? And then start visualizing your life. Where do you want your life to, to go in the next five to 10 years, 20 to 30 years? What do you want for yourself? 
once you're able to identify those things, where you're trying to go, now it's about being very intentional about getting there. Now it's time for us to create some smart goals up under those larger goals to figure out how do I achieve this wealth? How do I become a millionaire? How do I establish and or grow this business? So we got to figure out where you are right now. What are some things that you're struggling with? What are some things that you are ready to release? Because in order for us to truly go and to elevate into this next phase, we're going to have to leave some things behind. We're going to have to shed some yeah. dead skin. We're, we're going to have to get rid of some of those old habits, but we have to identify them. We have to address them. Yeah. We have to be willing to acknowledge them that they exist. And then we have to do the work to get rid of them and to start learning new things, to develop new habits, to ultimately leave you where you're trying to go. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. So good. Uh, thank you, Lindsay. And I just want to give you your flowers. Uh, June, our auntie says, uh, this girl is amazing. You are changing the trajectory for generations. Yes, you are. You absolutely are. I appreciate that. This is for all, us. Right. for all of us. Yeah, this is for us. And, and, and it's evident in the way you spoke to us. Like, this is this is dope. Um, okay, so the next question is uh, from Jazz. She asks, what are some key things you should be looking for or considering when deciding on where to build, where to begin building a strategic banking relationship? So one, I also say, start with proximity. Look at those institutions that are close to you as far as location, because when you're building a strategic banking relationship, you want to be able to stop into that branch. You want to start creating a relationship with those tellers, with those bankers that are there. Now, everybody within the retail banking space, they all serve in a different role. Everybody might not be able to ultimately help you apply for that loan, but everybody there can contribute to your overall relationship. Relationship. So it starts with the simple things. When you go in and make a deposit and make a withdrawal, are you engaging in conversations with their teller? That mm. Their job is to engage in conversation with you. Are we blowing them off? Are we on our phones? Are we mm. saying, oh, I don't really have time today. I just need my cash real quick. Like, how are we interacting with those people? Ultimately, when you notice a location that's close to you and they're able to provide you with customer service, you start from the teller line and then they're going to ultimately try to introduce you to a banker, one of those right. visits. And it's going to depend on how well you interact with the teller. It's like having a gatekeeper, you know, when you're trying that's to speak right. to an attorney or any right. a, a big dog, rather, they have somebody at first that you have to speak to and get to that right. receptionist or, you know, that administrative assistant. The teller is kind of that person when you're thinking about a bank and thinking about gatekeepers. That teller can give you access to everybody else within that banking system. A lot of times when they're in front of you and they're taking care of your transaction, a lot of times they're a Skype away from a person that you might need in another office. But if you're not taking care of them, if you're being rude to the tellers, if you're being very dismissive, it's going to be very hard for you to try to build that strategic relationship. So start with proximity because you want to actually be able to go in there, but also start looking up that company's values. Every institution is different. Some institutions have a heavy focus on small businesses and some don't. Some institutions have a very intentional focus on touching minority communities. Some institutions don't. Depending on where you live and depending on where that branch is centrally located in your city, a lot of times you will be able to tell what type of what type of banking relationship is that institution trying to create with the community. Um, right. One of the last institutions that I worked for, they had a multicultural segment of the bank, period. Wow. So there were certain branches. If you were located in a predominantly African-American community or if you were wow. located in a predominantly Hispanic community, they would have mostly people from that community working there. So you would walk yep. into the branch and see people who look like you. That yep. also 
matters. If you yeah. live in a community that's full of uh, black people, right? You don't want to walk into a branch and it's all white people in there. You don't. Right. You can walk right. into a bank and you can already tell their value system. You can already tell right. how they feel about that community by how they even show up, by how they place these branches, but that's also by the that. people that they are putting inside of these branch locations to help that's you. Real. So those are some of the small things, but then also just looking at their products and services online, it really just takes a Google search for you to search a bank, look at their products and services to even see if they have products and services that match where you are in your business life cycle. If you're a startup and all of their business accounts have fees, that might not be the very best place for you to start because if you're not necessarily generating any income, you don't necessarily want to be paying $10, $12 in service fees every single month for an account right. that's merely bringing in money. That's just depleting right. the assets that you do have. So even just thinking about those small things that matter, they go a very, very long way. And also, no. I will add I will add in there, um, if you have business besties, any people that you know and admire and business who are doing well, who speaks highly of their banking relationships, I would also ask them, send a referral. Who is your business banker? Do you love them? Let's talk about their relationship. How has that bank been able to help you? But also tapping into your centers of influence. If you have attorneys or attorney friends, if you have an accountant that you're working with, a bookkeeper, chambers of commerce, if you are a part of any organization that works with small business owners, I promise you, you are going to find bankers in there because they flock to those organizations who has their target audience there all already so That's sometimes right. it also starts with you meeting a person that you really like that you gel with and then you become of their a part of their institution because of that person that you met that's right I know that's I'm, answer, but no I that's so know. good that's so good because and i think we need to um be clear about this like a lot of times y'all we learn about playing the game and that's toxic right yeah. We learn about playing the game and you just networking just to because you need something and all of this stuff, right? But what Lindsay, what, what Lindsay is talking about is being very intentional and genuine. She didn't say like run game on the teller, right? Yeah. She didn't say act like you care about them. She said, see them. Are you speaking to them, et cetera? And then they will naturally. She didn't say on day one. She didn't say go go over there and tell. She said they're going to want to cape hard for you, right? And then the advisors are going to want to cape hard for you after that because they've gotten to know you right um she said reach out to your sisters and talk to them about their experiences with their bankers she did not say right she did not say act smooth up to somebody that you know is wearing louis vuitton bags and, and try to get no 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 no, no. right so I, I just want to highlight that as well because this is thought leadership and this is why we need to be on stage just telling our own stories right she didn't say play the game she said lean into community yep right she said, have an open heart to building new relationships, right? She said, cultivate those relationships and good things will come. So I want us to, I'm challenging us to let go of this, this crap, to be quite honest, we've been taught, right? Which, which causes us to be crabs in the barrel, right? And embrace genuineness and know that we love each other. The same way they feel it here, right? It operates like that in the outside world. We got to be different, right? <laughs> like we shift in, like, oh, oh, and speaking of shifts, Y'all might check one, two, one, two. Lindsay has shifted everything. Uh, the next TED Talk is at 1 Eastern instead of three minutes ago. Hello. Okay. All right. So we're going to keep it going, Lindsay. This is so, so good. Um, before I go to the next question, I want to throw a comment on stage um, just in case you have a response to this, Lindsay. So Janelle says her credit union is all virtual right now, even at the branch. It's just a person on the screen. Do you have any advice to her? I hate that um, because it's getting rid of jobs and I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. Um, but one thing I'm going to share is that you should not just be dependent on one banking relationship. I always personally believe that you should have a few. You should have a credit union relationship or a few 
and you should have traditional banking relationships because it's those traditional banks that you're going to see on every other block. It's the traditional banks that you're going to see that still are popping up branches out of the woodworks when everything else is closing. So if you notice that that is a thing with your credit union, I would look into a traditional bank that you do see more often in your community that you'd be willing to create a relationship with. And that's because they offer you different things, you know. Um, your credit union is going to offer you sometimes better rates. Your credit union, they are going to haggle you less because, you know, credit unions are typically nonprofit entities. So they're not just about the dollar, that bottom line. So your relationships with your credit unions are just going to be a tad bit different. But your traditional banks, a lot of times their technology is better. They have much better apps. You have the accessibility in the way that you can manage your finances with a traditional bank. It's just phenomenal, right? When you're working with a larger traditional bank, but also they are convenient because you do have traditional banks on every other corner. If it's not in your city, then they definitely have a branch in the next city over, right? So you have to think about what they're offering you because a lot of times what we run into with issues with credit unions and even me too, when you go to another city, another state rather, that credit union a lot of time is not available. Like for example, I do a lot of my banking with um, larger financial institutions, but I also bank with my local credit union here in North Carolina and North Carolina state employees is only in North Carolina. So mm -hmm. when I'm in Maryland taking care of business, I cannot necessarily access a branch for North Carolina State employees, which right. is unfortunate. But you just have to understand how these systems work and you have to create your own system within what they have, within the options that they give you. It's building right. your own financial infrastructure. Where do you have right. your relationships? How do you manage those relationships? Where are they? How can some of them cross? Um, for right. me, with my traditional bank, you can add, and most banks you can now, but you can add non-bank accounts to your online banking so that you can transfer money. So because I bank with a large institution and they do give me that type of access, I added my credit union account that I typically will use for certain things to that bank's profile so that online I can go to my traditional bank and still transfer money from my credit union because they allow me to add non-bank accounts to that online profile. So you just have to learn how your institutions are operating and then you have to create a structure within the current infrastructure that works specifically for you but you definitely should have a credit union and a traditional bank you want to definitely have both i love that distinction because y'all right get out of the scarcity mindset it's not either or it's either and yep yep right so uh Know that you are not a burden, burden that you are worthy, that your money spends just as well as anybody. I mean, all of this stuff, like, like let's let's accept that into our mindset first, right? Mm -hmm. And let's combine all of the things that we've learned thus far, right? The vision board, we know what our five-year plan is, right? Planning, smart goals. We know how we're going to calibrate ourselves as we go along. So, so you need to be ready for the here and now and the thin, right? So like Lindsay is saying, if you know that you're about to be crossing state lines and even on a global level and you need to be able to make them transactions and all of that, okay, let's go ahead and start getting that in place now. Yeah. And if we know that we need the car loan at 1.63%, 1 like Lindsay, let's talk to the credit union. I mean, come on, right? It's not either or, right? Like, let's get out of that, right? Um, I love this. I love this. I love this. Um, Danelle said, thank you. She loved your response. All right, let's get into some more questions. What up, Miss T? Um, okay, so the next question is from our girl Katrina. So Katrina says, or asks rather, what is a great way to start building credit worthiness with little credit, but 10 years of history? Mostly high doctor bills and no credit cards. Love this question. I love this question too. Um, I always say sometimes you have to start small and it's okay to start small. And because of the way that you framed that question, I'm going to assume that your credit score isn't necessarily where you want it to be, right? So ultimately, there is a starting point. A lot of people start with secure cards, right? 
they're not favorable because yes, it's you putting in your own money, but you are ultimately investing in yourself. That secured money, that secured card that you're opening, it's an investment. I don't want us to look at it as, why do I have to do this? Why am I giving them my money to spend anyway? It's just a starting phase. It's like a startup of your credit, ultimately, where you take at that institution, whatever their requirement is, you give them that amount of money and they give you a credit card in exchange. You just got to learn how to use it, right? So making sure that we are not exceeding our limits ever, you know, if you can stay under 30%, great. Sometimes that's not even always realistic because emergencies happen, things happen where you have to use your card. Sometimes you got to go up to 50%. Sometimes you might have to max it out one day for a purchase. But it's about before that next statement period hits, make sure that you have paid that card down as much as possible. Um, also with secured cards specifically, it's also about how you're managing all of your other credit around it, right? So let's just say you have a secured card with XYZ Bank, but let's just say you still have an old credit card that you might not have taken the best care of it, and that's okay because you didn't know over here, right, that's carrying a high balance or you might have a missed payment or two. You have to know that that is going to affect whether or not this particular secured card can convert to an unsecured card. So it's also about the entire credit picture. But another way that I always tell people, if, you, if you're not comfortable with getting a secured card first, or if you just, you're just not in a position where you can do that, if you have a close family member or somebody, a great friend that you trust who has good credit, see if they'd be willing to add you as an authorized signer to that credit card. But in doing so, you want to make sure that that credit card has only had good history, meaning that they don't have any missed or late payments, making sure that they have never maxed that card out for real if you can, because just like you will inherit that good credit, you will also inherit that bad credit. So you got to be very, very, very careful. And a lot of times you don't have, it's harder sometimes to go this route because it's a trust thing, right? You have to trust that person that they're going to be honest and truthful about what they're saying about this credit line, but they also have to trust you. Right. Because as an authorized signer, yes, you now have the option to go and spend, spend, spend. But I always say when before you even position this question to someone, position it with a plan. You know, I would like to be an authorized signer for the next 24 months to help me do X, Y, Z. I don't need a card. I don't want a card. I just want to be on the account. I want to attach that history to my personal credit profile to achieve X, Y, Z goal. You can't just go in and ask them, hey, you can get me to your credit card and not give them some additional facts about one, how that process is truly going to help you. How is it going to benefit you? But also how you're going to have to reassure them that you're not going to mess anything up for them. And that's by telling them, hey, I don't want a card because ultimately you don't really need a card to get the history and to benefit from it. You just need your account to be attached to that relationship. So either we can start with the secured card or you can asked to be an authorized signer on someone's account. This is really good. And I want to um, break down some jargon just in case some people are not familiar with some of these terms, right? Because if we haven't had close proximity, honestly, yeah. right, to um, someone who understands finance or in banking worlds or have our own personal bankers, then some of these words uh, you might not have understanding of, right? So when Lindsay says secure card, She's meaning that it's different from your traditional credit card where they give you a piece of plastic and you didn't put up any collateral, right? right. Uh, if you think about a house, right, You you there is collateral associated with it, right? You put down a down payment, so there's cash, a certain percentage of that, and the house itself can be taken back if you don't pay it back, right? Yes. So the house is secured. The mortgage is secured. So when Lindsay is signing secured um line of credit secure credit card it it literally means you put up some collateral which is cash um and it might seem silly in the beginning like okay i'm giving you a thousand dollars and you give me a thousand dollar credit card what but like like lindsay said this is strategic you are literally building credit for your business okay right so um this but this is dope because we are putting these terms in in examples that we understand right so in the business world we call this pitching when we go to somebody and say 
I need this. I want this. This is what it's going to do for me. And I'm not even giving you anything. That's pitching, right? Like what she described is pitching. So when you're going to the, the, the person saying, can I be an authorized signer so that I can build my credit? This is what it'll do for me. That is pitching. Why is that important? We understand that it's pitching because the same is done when you go into investors. You're pitching. You already described the plan. You understand where you want to be in two years. You have the view of how it's going to help you. You might not give them nothing. But they might give you an angel investment and say, okay, here go $1,000. Like, this is powerful right here, y'all. Um, and I'm so happy that you're absorbing this um, and you're going to put it to use. Okay, let me keep going in the questions. Lindsay, super fire. Thank you so much for your information. Um, next one, we're going to Janelle. Janelle asks, is there is there a certain level we need to reach as far as cash flow through our accounts or time in business before we can begin development of our banking relationships? No, ma'am. Build them now. Build them before you have the big bucks, because what's going to happen is when you do have the big bucks, then you're going to feel this level of audaciousness when you walk in there and they don't want to help you. Right. Oh, you don't want to cash my check or you don't want to do this. But I have X, Y, Z coming in through this account. The thing is, is that if they don't have a relationship with you. They're still going to treat you like everybody else. And there mm -hmm. is going to become a, part, a, a point in time where you're going to have a big check for a client that you're going to want to be cash within the next few days. And because of the dollar amount, they're going to say, hey, I'm going to need to put a hold on this for seven days. When you have a relationship, you have an advocate in the bank, someone who knows you, understands your business, but also knows that you probably need those funds. They will be willing to put their name on releasing those holds versus someone that they have not built a relationship, regardless of how much money that you have in that bank. I say start now start as early as possible some people start their relationships when they're opening their account when they are beginning the relationship with that institution um the previous institution that i work with and i really really appreciate how they take care of their business clients um bbnt now truest they have it set up where every branch manager of any branch is automatically a business development officer so if you walk into a branch and there is a branch manager there then you already know for that institution that that can be your relationship relationship manager and you start building that relationship day one while you're opening that account ask questions get to know them get to know how long have they been doing what they do how long have they been supporting small business clients in particular you want to know who are they connected to do they have any centers of influence that they will be able to refer you to any accountants lawyers bookkeepers anybody that can be beneficial to you and your business especially that will help you build your financial dream team you want to know what organizations are they a part of are they a part of any local chambers of commerce? Do they support any local small business accelerators or incubators in your town? You want to vet them out just like they're going to be vetting you out because while they're opening your they're opening your accounts and establishing that relationship, they're going to be asking you about your finances. Ultimately, they ask you questions, they build rapport, they get to know you and understand your financial world so that they, they can make the appropriate recommendations for services and products that could be useful for you as you're growing your business and you need that you just have to be willing to be very transparent and to be vulnerable in those conversations because they can't help you if you're not transparent they can only give you what you allow them to give you honestly because you can control how much you receive from them in that conversation but also you got to know what questions to ask you also got to know how to engage in these conversations and show up confident in who you are forget your credit score forget where you where you've been because we know where you're going that's they right. need to be attached to where you're going to and you need to right. get as much help and support from them as possible especially because that support can be free free yep. yep that's right um this is so good i want to um highlight uh paquita's comment about thinking that truest was suntrust or something you're not wrong a merger happened so bb and right. suntrust combined which made them one of the top biggest banks and they're not huge but they up there you know because they combined so yep. you're not wrong um Jazz just comments, I'm just gonna flash this on the stage, that 
or, or wondering whether you're talking about personal or business, you're talking about your business. Like you need to have a business relationship manager. Um, but anything you want to add on this? Because personal, Excuse you use my grammar, to... but it's both fun for me. It's both fun. Both fun. Both fun. You want to create fun. relationships for both fun because even as your business banker, they still want to support you with your personal needs. Like when I was in business banking, it was very important for us to connect with business owners specifically because business owners bring you two different sides of the pot. They can bring you their business, their business accounts, their business relationships, but they also have personal needs. You're still a human. You still have personal financial goals. Your business banker can take care of both pots for you. So you want both of them. That's dope. Love, love, love this. And, you know, different banks are different, right? So yeah. I was at Bank of America, which y'all know is huge, right? So we had a department for everything, right? Um, you had your people who can help you with your brokerage account, you had people who can help you with your personal fund, you know, all of this stuff. But the dope thing is, no matter how, no matter how your business, your bank is structured, like Lindsay is saying, like these people have the inside knowledge and the inside connection. So even if it's not them, they can bridge you to somebody else who can help. And because you have a relationship, like if you don't have a lot of money or if your credit score is bad, they can have a conversation and cake for you like Lindsay did for the person who was originally denied and make sure you are seen. Like like there are humans behind, like the Wizard of Oz is not some incredible, like superhuman thing. It's a little regular, mediocre little person, right? Uh, so don't be afraid. Um, this is super dope, Lindsay. Um, all right, I'm gonna flash this on stage. This is from Paquita. Paquita says, Thankfully, I have great financial health. However, I don't have business credit cards or accounts. I do have a credit card and checking solely for my business, but they are both consumer products. Should I convert them even if my business is under 20K annual? Yes. Um, absolutely, yes. One, because you don't want to be co-mingling. When you're in consumer products, that can kind of be seen still technically as co-mingling. Like, for example, when the PPP came out, right, we could not issue loans into a personal account, even if it was solely used for the business. So definitely, definitely convert. Honestly, I established my business relationship um, before I even was really operating in this capacity in my business. I was still working at the bank. And at that time, I just used the income for my business came from my rental properties. Right. And it wasn't a lot. It was less than 20K as well. But because I also had good personal credit at the time, when I opened up that account, I was able to instantly apply for a business credit card. Mind you, I had less than 20K in revenues, but it was based on my personal personal credit and based on the additional personal income that I had at the time for my debut two job. And I was able to get a $10,000 business credit card to help me get started because you do not want to accumulate a lot of business debt on your personal credit because it is going to drastically pull down your personal credit score and it has nothing to do with you personally great example of a real life situation. When I opened that account and applied for that business credit card, I did a balance transfer because I, just like you, I had some business debt that was sitting on my personal credit cards. When it comes to personal credit cards, that revolving, that's a revolving line. They count heavily towards your credit score. They do not want to see you having high revolving debt. So once I got that business credit card, I did a balance transfer from my personal credit card to my business credit card and my personal credit card shot up over 30 points because I got rid of that debt because depending on the institution now that business credit card will not show up on your personal credit profile and that is what you want you want to separate your business credit from your personal credit to separate that liability you want the business to pay for its own expenses that it's accumulating you don't want it heavily impacting your personal credit and sometimes people wait until it's too late they've already maxed out all of their personal savings they've maxed out most of their personal credit cards right and now when you want to go up apply for business credit is too late we got to start getting in and doing it from the beginning yeah that's good um and we only have seven minutes left until the ted talk but i want to let you all know before you start crying that uh lindsay is doing a ted talk tomorrow um called liability or legacy 
right? So there's going to be more uh, topics around this. Uh, and there's also going to be a very intimate um, fireside chat that her and I will have tomorrow about finance as well called Building Black Wealth. So um, we're not done with it. I'm telling you this today so you mark it on your calendars, right? Go ahead in the schedule tab and add it to your personal calendar so you get reminders. Um, but we're going to get to this last question. <laughs> but just know it's not over. There's more. There's more tomorrow. Um, I don't know. Okay, so it just... The the Q and I just tripled before I could get back to it. Uh, we'll try to get that in. So Paige asks um, or says, our business uses an online bank, Nova. Is it possible to build relationships with such a distant structure? It is possible. It's going to be different. It's, it's very much so going to look different. So just be okay with different. But I would say give them a call. Um, I don't personally bank with them. I do have some clients who do. Um, but I would give them a call. And when you do speak to someone in customer service, I would ask them, is it possible for you to be assigned a relationship manager so that you have one person that you consistently speak with? Because that's the real key to also building these relationships is having a a consistent person that you can go to to talk about your needs, to talk about what you have going on, to brainstorm, to get a different perspective. Because just like me, they're going to be able to come to you with additional information that you might not have had access to had you not spoken with them. So I would ask them if they have a structure where you can be assigned a relationship manager. Good info. Thank you, Lindsay. Not a um, this one, this next one comes from Neff. Uh, Neff says this may not be an appropriate question but i applied for a duns number it's good this is good i'm glad we're getting all the things uh, i applied for a duns number and was denied and was given several generic reasons ultimately i believe it was because i classified my business under the wrong code how would you recommend one avoid that I would give them a call. I don't know if you spoke to them online, like via their chat, or you just received a letter. I would give them a call and make them break it down to you, but then also ask them, well, how can you still get approved? So if it's if it's just as simple as you changing your code from your business, you going online and finding a different next code or whatever you need, but I would call them. You get so much more clarity talking to somebody over the phone or in person. Now with Duns, you're not really going to find anybody in person to talk to. So that's why I say call them and ask specifically, what do you need to do? How can you avoid that? Because everybody's systems are different. Like just like everybody's banking system is different. Everybody's personal financial situation is different, but I would give them a call to figure out how you can avoid that. That'll be something that comes directly from them. And just to break down the jargon a bit, Lindsay, let's let's talk about what a Dunn's number is. Uh, can you can you explain how level what a Dunn's number is versus your traditional like FICO or other other credit scores? Right. So your DUNS is pretty much, it's an identifier for your business, right? DUNS isn't necessarily the credit report. It is a system that collects data. And with DUNS, they have partnerships with a number of um, business credit providers. They have partnerships with companies and vendors that you guys are building relationships with. And these vendors, if they have a relationship with Dun & Bradstreet, then they are reporting your payment history. They are reporting how you are using these trade lines. And it's important because one, you need a Dun & Bradstreet number and a Sam's number really to do business with government contracts. But you have some, some institution who actually will look at your Dun's report to base their credit decision off of. Now, not all financial institutions even really review Dun & Bradstreet for real. Let me just be honest. Um, a lot of financial institutions use what we call the small business financial exchange. Um, and they have partnerships. The SBFE have partnerships with a lot of large banks that ultimately does the same thing. It collects your data, your, your financial data, almost like blockchain kind of. It's collecting all of the financial data attached to your EIN number and attached to your DUNS number if you have one. Um, this is so good, y'all, uh, because, and I'll just say this from 
So, so for background, you'll hear more about us tomorrow, but for background, so Lindsay has been on the, the business banking relationship side, right? Like caping for businesses and understanding where they want to go, right? And I was on the credit side, meaning I was saying yes or no to loans. I was looking at your history of performance, right? I was looking at the story that your data told. And I was looking to see what size would be good for this person. Or do we even want to do anything at all? Or because their relationship is so good and long with us, I'll, I'll bend on them and take a chance, right? And these are people making these decisions, right? So um, understanding the DUNS number as well as all of these other things is important because the more good data you have, the better story it tells. And the people, I was a person sitting there writing loans. And I'm talking about like Loans is built big as a hundred billion dollars for big mergers, right? Like these these SunTrust and these Truist or, or SunTrust and BBTs, right? But it's literally people making these decisions, not not computers. So what Lindsay is telling you is so important about relationship building and giving them a call and all of that because literally a person's yes changes the game for you. It is not computers making these decisions. A person's yes unlocks everything so just understand that um and we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have guessed that we wouldn't have known that right otherwise um all right so that wraps it up we're going to the next thing i thank you so much lindsay um can't wait for you to continue dropping gems tomorrow thank you for extending this time i didn't even ask this but i know you were right i know of you were right so. <laughs> anything thank for you, you know. blaze Anything Thank for our community, you. our ladies, please, please, please reach out to me. You do not have to do this alone. I am going to drop our email address again in the chat so that you have that. Please, please, please contact us, guys. I, I want to help you. And I specifically in my business, I only support people of color. Come on now. It's rare that you find that in financial services companies. So I'm here for you. I love you guys. Please, please, please enjoy the rest of the summit. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. Hey, all right, y'all. We'll see you at the TED Talk. Peace.